My name is Eric, and I'm here with Michael. And uh, Michael, as you know, today's theme is I don't know death to double feature. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, what? What was the actual plan for uh, for today? I think it's uh, let's we can really boil it down to uh, odd comedies that nobody's ever paid enough attention to. Yeah, independent comedies is that yeah, based? I was on... thinking independent comedies with literally no internet presence for some yeah, reason. That's good. I think I think the bases of both of these films are possibly the thing that's most interesting about them. Oh sure. And they're I mean obviously they come from two different places, but I think where they come from is fascinating to me. Why do you think there is before we get to the spoiler and chapter warning, which is I know why people are even tuning in in the first place. Uh what the fuck's going on here? Why aren't there giant hubs of information and communication and people talking and chatting about these movies these were pretty popular movies i would think yeah i would imagine they'd have to be just based on is based that a on, comedy thing i don't know i i I've not call comedies therefore people on the internet do not talk about yeah well i i don't think that comedies ever get the following that uh that normal films do i'm always surprised when when comedies get sequels here's an example grown-ups 2 is happening yeah right and i'm sitting there i don't know wondering why and apparently it was successful enough for a sequel but i don't think i've talked to any single person about it this is a really interesting idea and i don't want to pass it up but there's no point in putting it inside one of the chapters of one of these movies because i think it does apply to both Mm -hmm. i'm curious if comedies are just a, a type of movie that doesn't maybe the fan base doesn't overlap between popular comedy and something like cult movie. Uh I don't know, though. The Hangover, right? Right. The Hangover is an extremely popular comedy franchise at this point. Mm -hmm. When I think American comedies of the last 10 years, I think that's a name you really can't gloss over. Right. If I type The Hangover in Google, I'm going to assume that I'm going to get like a fucking a Hangover wiki and like a bunch of Hangover fan pages. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's true or not, but I definitely don't get that for a clown or safety not guaranteed. Right. There is not a clown wiki. Why is that? I don't understand. Well, I, they I, have really high scores on all the things where people score movies. Uh huh. Critics wrote about them. Sure. People went out in droves to see them. Clown is a fucking international success. Right. Well, also, you can't overlook what ended up happening because of safety not guaranteed and the people behind that. These films ended up creating a legacy that just kind of seems invisible unless you're looking for it. Well, that's my hope today, is that by placing our dumb little show on the internet, there will be yet another thing that appears in search results. Essentially, that's what I want, is when you type these things in, uh, our show comes up. Things like our show, where people are milling over ideas, Mm -hmm. and I don't know, fucking posting artwork or something. Anyways, there's spoilers inside uh, inside our podcast today. Yep. And if you really just don't want the spoilers, which, I mean, I think will be pretty heavy in both movies, especially the latter, go ahead and skip over those movies. Um, again, thinking about the purpose of a comedy might be a little bit different than other genres. Maybe people just go to these movies for other reasons. Mm-hmm. But I believe spoilers are just as prevalent in comedies as they are anywhere else. Yep. So skip them. Skip the fucking spoilers. Clown is uh, a movie from 2010. And a reminder that kids are the fucking worst thing ever. (laughs) Probably not the thing I'm supposed to get out of Clown. But uh, God cannot stand to be around children. A longstanding uh, problem of double feature, I think. Well, yeah, but we've also had our moments where we praise child actors. And they're, they're weird moments for both of us. Every time we see child actors. Yeah, it's true. I think is... Where we praise it's child because actors. it's because we're surprised they can do stuff uh-huh. other than uh, other than ruin your uh, tour de pussy. <laughs> so clown is uh, clown is it's Danish, right? Well, it's off that. I don't know if you've ever seen anything. The the clown, the uh, Danish fucking six season sitcom, seven seasons. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, you know, 
long-standing Danish sitcom. And it's uh, it's actually just as good, if not. Uh, I mean, by having more content, I suppose it's probably arguably better than the movie. <laughs> but I think it falls pretty firmly in the same area that The Simpsons did when The Simpsons finally came out with their big movie. See, here I am being an American and going, ah, yes, a TV show that got a movie. Let me put that in the American realm. <laughs> right. The Simpsons being a 22 or 29 season television show that finally got a movie. And I think everybody walked out of the movie thinking one of two things. If they're a bitter jerk, they thought that sucked. That wasn't as good as the Simpsons haven't been good since they since season two. Sure. But if they were a normal person, they probably walked out of that the movie theater going, that was uh that was probably just as good, if not better, than some of the best single episodes of The Simpsons. Did it need to be two hours? Maybe not. <laughs> so to go back to Clown, thank you. <laughs> I think that unlike the Simpsons movie, the Clown movie gets a lot more going for it because it's a film because they can do things like finger a woman's asshole and it's not potentially prime time sure. suicide or uh or they could you show think they get a, to push a boundary a little bit more sure well i i can't i mean and i've never been to denmark i don't know what their equivalent of the fcc would say about showing a little kid's penis on tv sure but again the simpsons have never shown a penis on the television. And if we're just going by the standard of The Simpsons... <laughs> Is that a standard uh, word? Clown gets away with a lot more. You know, that fucking prosthetic cost $3,000. Really? Yeah. So why? Supply and demand or something. I don't know. Scarcity <laughs> yeah, in the market. Okay. I don't know why it cost $3,000. Sure, sure. Well, what's interesting about that... Did you know about the TV show before the movie? I didn't know about it before the movie. I knew about it during the movie because I have that thing where when I'm watching things, <laughs> the second something piques my curiosity, I'm on Wikipedia. Jump on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> terrible film audience. You I was going, terrible. who's who's that guy? Why, he, he looks familiar. Casper something? Hey, look, he did a Lars von Trier movie. Wait, he wrote this? Wait, he wrote the entire series? There's a series? <laughs> I'm downloading it. I don't know how you go see movies in theaters. I guess that's part of the joy of seeing something in a that theater is, is no choice. one will let you use wikipedia <laughs> exactly that's one of the reasons i have to see things in a theater so people will keep you off the internet yeah yeah you know i hadn't heard about this either and so you create a movie and you instantly have access to a huge market that you wouldn't have otherwise i mean the question of why create a movie when you have a television show for so long if you're curious about the difference between the mediums I mean, what better test case for that? You know, you have your control group right there. You had a television show. You've did it for years. You know who the audience is. You know what you can do in the medium. And then you create a movie and you see what's different about that. It tells you a lot about the medium of film. And one thing right away, you know, we've, we've already hit on is things you can get away with in a movie for whatever reason. Brings up a lot of interesting questions like, why is that? Why is there still a gap between TV and film. Mm -hmm. You know, why can you just not do some things on television than you can in film? And I think that moves into the second part a little bit, which is audience. Mm -hmm. You would think, well, maybe TV is more accessible. Sure. Maybe it's easier for people to get it. And organizations like you mentioned, like the FCC might have something to do with, well, you can't say this here. Too many people can see this. Too many people might accidentally flip the channel to AMC and see Walter White's pale ass. But what about, you know, the fact that neither of us had even heard of this television right. series <laughs> until we saw the movie? Wouldn't that point to the movie being, you know, more accessible? Right. Uh, literally, not in, not in the, the sense we usually use the word accessible, but I mean, have access to. Right. You know, the movie came and found us uh, rather than, you know, than stumbling upon it. So I don't know. It's certainly a reason to do a movie. But as television gets better and better, I become more interested in why do people do TV over film? Where is the place of film in an area where TV is artistically just as good? Mm -hmm. If those are two kind of equal tools that just have different uses, I don't know. I'm interested in what they are. So Clown is a really good case for that. And I think the fact that we found it and we hadn't known about the television show is just something interesting. I don't know if you've seen, the, you know, the other crazy thing is this being a Danish movie. It is marketed differently in Danish areas than here. Hmm. 
And I'm used to for clown the big pink poster, right? With with uh, Frank in his underwear and uh, Bo right. kind of sure. looking up at him, like, "Why did you pull on my penis?" Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's. I think that's the look he's giving. Have you seen any of the other posters? No. <laughs> so fitting. There's a poster of Frank in the American Beauty petals. <laughs> wow. <laughs> which is, yeah, which is pretty great. Uh, same kind of blissful blissful look <laughs> although i think mina savari had a sexual you know uh-huh. sexual innocence look but frank just looks uh-huh. happy that he's surrounded frank Vom has one of those faces that man i, know. I mean if you want to we need we need to we need to pitch like a superhero movie where it's like steve buscemi is the hero and frank Vom <laughs> is his sidekick sure or perhaps a miniseries there you go uh, to be depending on the content caught in hbo gridlock for a decade uh, there's also a poster of Casper and a pile of naked women. That's awesome. I don't know that that's an international poster, but I know it has nudity on it and therefore cannot be shown in America because of the right. puritanical society that's that we market hilarious. to. Most importantly, I think, is when you search for clown poster, you uh, the majority of what you get is killer clowns from outer space. <laughs> <laughs> so... So know that, again, getting back to this idea of what you search for on the internet, where are the cult fan bases, in an arena where, if you look at Killer Clowns from Outer Space and the movie Clown, I think one of those is clearly grossed more money than the other, although I might be wrong, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, strangely, that is not represented in search results. Yeah. In search results, Killer Clowns from Outer Space still looks like it dwarfs Clown in popularity. Ah, the internet is a strange place. So there's a lot of really memorable spots in Clown that mm. I just feel like, you know, for for stuff that I'm familiar with and then for things I've just never really seen a movie do things like that. Yeah. You know, we've mentioned the climactic ending. Which to me, that doesn't even, that's not really the peak moment for me as far as this film. Because I, I read um I read a really brief description about or not a description, it was kind of a, it was like a Netflix review. Uh huh. Somebody else had watched it and said something along the A user the lines. review for the, right. uh, for the film. I was just curious, and, and they said like, oh my God, it's so funny, but it's so wrong, but it's so funny. And whenever anybody sure. says something is wrong, <laughs> you know, that's not right, that's wrong, uh, I'm automatically of the mindset that it's not going to phase me. <laughs> sure. Anybody, You're already prepared to go. Fuck you, movie. Anybody who I'll show you so wrong. Anybody who looks at the back catalog of Double Feature, sure, will know that chances are that's wrong. Will not phase me in a movie until a character is ejaculating on his girlfriend's mother's face. Oh God, I know. And suddenly, I put my hands up and go, "I that's not a movie I thought I was watching." <laughs> right. Well, because you're prepared for something like, you know, the taboo of child pornography. Sure. And especially uh, treating a child in a way that I guess I wouldn't say it's sexual. No. You know, it's really not sexual, but it's certainly invoking that idea. That's the fear that, mm-hmm. you know, you're worried people will see this photo and think there's something sexual about it, especially when you see the photo. Yeah. The sure. fact that he's touching him and it's just, yeah. you know, it's very... It's weird. It's fucking weird is what it is. Criminally and, and I guess morally incriminating yeah. is how the photo feels. But you're kind of, you're almost braced for that. Yeah. You're going, I know they're going to, I know they're going to fucking soon, show the photo. As soon as Casper leaves the phone there, yep. you know that that's coming back. <laughs> but something like... um Jerking off into her eye. Yeah. It just, that... it's bad enough when you... When you think it's his girlfriend, and it's just even worse, then she has to have a fucking eye patch. Uh, the and- pearl necklace in general, the whole <laughs> idea of, you know, all of these old guys standing around talking to him about it with completely straight faces. Right. You know, you got to get her a pearl necklace. I wish that I could orchestrate that. Yeah. You know, I do not know four other people who could be like, no, 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 pearl necklace, like, you know, you come in her face while she's sleeping. I guess that's his bad aim too, right? Sure. Uh, right. Chest come on her chest while she's sleeping. I couldn't do that with a straight face. I certainly right. couldn't get four other people to agree to say it with a straight face. Well, and that's another thing about this film is is we talk a lot on Double Feature about the use of deadpan and about not breaking character. We just did the FP not too long ago, mm-hmm. uh, if right. you remember. And um, it's this kind of thing where 
in a film like Clown, characters, especially, again, I'm going back to Frank, but characters like Frank who are just slightly out of place in a social setting, just in society. Sure. I can't think of a character that I've seen in film that can come on his girlfriend's mother's face and then just kind of say, oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, and like, and feel awkward about it. Right. I mean, he feel he's he's standing there looking awkward. And this, of course, comes shortly on the heels of abandoning a young child asleep in a room full of criminals. Yeah. The bankruptcy of the morality between Casper and Frank is somehow as endearing as it is horrendous because <laughs> well you, because he's kind of a you know, a child in a man's body at right. that point you know and, especially when you're considering all these things about childhood because of the plot of the film sure he just looks like a kid who accidentally did something wrong over right. and over <laughs> no matter well, how horrendous you know the thing he did and is. then casper feels like that kid whose house you'd go and sleep over at who the, like the for <laughs> right. me for, for me really good example i remember i was in third fourth grade maybe maybe a little older and i went and stayed over at my friend's house this is this is an interesting story but this is this is where i feel casper lives in this film and i was sleeping over at my my friend's house and i fell asleep and i woke up probably an hour or two hours later and noticed that the two guys that had been sleeping there with like in the room mm -hmm. had like vanished and they went somewhere else so i noticed that there was a blue glow coming from the adjacent room and I walked into that room to see what was going on. And that was when I first saw porn. Oh, sure. Was God, this kid whose house it was had brought the other guy who I guess didn't fall asleep or I don't know, they were mutually masturbating and decided to up the <laughs> ante or whatever the hell kids do these days. Right. He was, I, I mean, it, it wasn't, see, and this is the important, this is the important distinctive factor is he wasn't pulling up porn to go, whoa, porn is hot, porn is sexy. He was sure. pulling up porn to go, I can look at porn. This is sure. my computer. My parents yeah. are asleep. Look how cool I am. Yeah, right. And that's Showing how off. Casper feels to me. Is he's not getting laid because he likes to have sex. <laughs> he's getting laid because he wants to prove to Frank that nothing can stop him from getting sure, laid. Totally. And so in situations where Casper is banging the pancake lady and begging Frank to join in, those scenes hit so close to home for me. <laughs> Right. I just I mean, I was I was literally laughing out loud through that entire scene. And then again, back to the look on Frank's face when he sticks his finger right in her butt. Right. Right. And he's he's doing it in a completely utilitarian fashion. Mm -hmm. He's not sure it's the right move. But yeah, I mean, it is the least he can do. She took them in and she fed them and she's giving them a place <laughs> to stay. Right. Think of all she's done for us. Yeah. <laughs> And how nonchalant that is. It's perfect. I also love, uh, in that anecdote, talking about, you know, the kids are looking at porn because it's not okay to look at porn. I mean, yeah, exactly. we've created the, when you think about, oh no, a bunch of, a bunch of kids unsupervised looking at pornography. I mean, they're literally only doing it because right. they're not supposed well, to. And furthermore, think of all the, think of all the people going back to your, your mention of the puritanical notion of the american society <laughs> right. think of all the people that upon hearing the story that i just told are gonna fucking lech and try to pass some laws that prevent kids from being right, able to look right. at computers after midnight or some shit yeah i know like gremlins or whatever <laughs> right when in reality if that computer weren't there we may well have been out on the street fucking throwing rocks through windows sure you know what i mean yeah if porn is the thing kids are doing late at night at least they're safe in the basement so the entire idea of frank's character is he uh at least in the film as a separate kind of uh episode of the you know story from the tv show is that he wants to prove he could be a good father and being the kind of character he is it seems like that's perfect to play on a comedic element of what you think of as Frank, you know, being somebody who is, like I said, child in a man's body or don't cringe when I say this in a state of arrested development. Uh huh. But you know what I mean, right? Sure. He's somebody who I, you know, poor father figure because he is still a child himself. Right. He still takes no responsibility for his actions and how much better to play up the comedic element of that character than go, 
okay, well, you got to prove that you can be a man and that you can raise this child. Yeah. When, you know, every time you look at the child and how stupid he's acting, you're going, <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, Frank's really no better than that. <laughs> if anything, Frank's years of experience as an adult have just put him in worse scenarios. Yeah. Because when he fucks up, exactly. it's, you know, coming in a woman's eye. Sure. Or sending her to the. Think about what he gets arrested for. Sure, sure. I mean, that's a child's move, but yeah, as an yeah, adult, right. he gets a kid would do that and I mean, I don't think a kid would get to the level that Frank did and and be able to hold their ground and go this is the decision I'm making. Well, sure, that's the thing is when you become an adult, those those uh you've upped the ante so much right. with every passing year of your life, you get into more dangerous territory sure. with being childish right? to the point where you are uh, running in with a gun and demanding someone give you the toy you want. Right. Well, and that's the thing is, and, and I mean, that is, that is a perfect analogy for being a grown up child is he is basically at gunpoint yeah. robbing this store of a toy. Right, right. It's perfect to to show what an adult child might do, which again, to go back to my story from before, some fourth graders in a basement, the porn they're getting is Google Images. <laughs> right. You know, right. You type porn into Google Images or boobs into Google Images, and then you turn the safe search off. Right. Meanwhile, somebody who's 30 is fucking logging on typing in their credit card number into brazilian <laughs> fart porn websites right right i mean the just to if be, only they had the experience as a child of using a search engine instead i'm just saying once you're an adult you to do the same action you do it so much more completely and devotedly well you also have more power well exactly it. you don't even think about the power you sure yield. You don't have to do it in secret anymore, and and you can go out there and swing a pistol, and the only person who's really got to answer for it is you and everybody you're responsible for. <laughs> so as we're watching this uncomfortable type of comedy, mm -hmm. which I think is has become has gone from a small subgenre of comedy to one of the more predominant forms of comedy, mm -hmm. especially when you think about what's on television or even. You know, I mentioned The Hangover earlier. Um, you mentioned Grown Ups just being absurdly popular American yeah. comedies. I think those even, while they try and go for more of a pop element, play a lot on uncomfortable comedy. Mm -hmm. What do you think the purpose of uncomfortable comedy is? Is it literally just for the comedic element or is there another? I mean, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dial this all the way back to The Office. Do you remember when The Office came out and that was a huge deal? Sure. And everybody kept making fun of The Office, but praising it at the same time by saying, it's just like your boring office job, but funny. Mm -hmm. And The Office, I think, was one of the first big American things to capitalize on the awkward comedy. Ironically. Yeah. And I think that... Before uh, we get hate mail from people who've never fucking heard this show before, yeah, we know. Ricky Gervais. Yeah. Leave us alone. But I think uh, jokes are an all too often tapped medium. It's easy to do something funny, slapstick. It's easy to beat somebody up. It's easy to have somebody get a big wedgie on a fence. And everybody's like, huh, that's goofy. That guy's underwear is up over his head but it's another thing entirely to tap into something that people don't often admit has even happened or the kinds of feelings that you're constantly struggling with ever showing somebody sure to get into the point of somebody's mind where their discomfort lives mm -hmm. and then to go no it's okay that you're uncomfortable because it's hilarious right, right. i think it forms a much stronger bond between your audience and the art because you're hitting them in a place they're not comfortable showing you they have. Sure. But then you're going, no, no, not picking on you. We're not exploiting the fact that this makes you uncomfortable. Right. We want you to realize that everyone you're watching this with and everybody who watches this movie all finds this uncomfortable because this happens to everybody. Sure. And maybe it's not as extreme as, as fingering the asshole of the woman whose you know bed you're sharing but right it is the kind of thing where i always go back to that that episode of the office with the dinner party where it legitimately turns into nearly a domestic dispute mm -hmm. and there's a lot of those in clown too where frank and his girlfriend are talking and casper and his wife have these arguments and it feels so real in its level of uncomfortable right but that reality is relatable sure and so well i mean it's social missteps that's what's at the core of a lot of these right 
uh, if not the the entire genre, is extreme ends of the worst decision you ever made, you know, social decision you ever made in your life. It's always a series of just one after another. I almost wonder if that's a writing tactic. Yeah. You know, when you're writing comedy that lives in an awkward space or in an, an uncomfortable uh, kind of place, if you don't just go, what is the situation? What is the worst fucking decision a person could mm-hmm. make at every turn? I mean, at what point in this film would you have just fucking killed yourself in shame? Oh, you know man. what I mean? It's really early on. Probably early. I don't know right? if I would have come back to the house after abandoning the kid. I know. <laughs> I know. And that's, you know, that's fucking early. So I'm always at internal odds with that because when I'm watching a comedy, for some reason, it's different for me than when I'm watching a French extremism film. Mm-hmm. Yet it's poking around into taboos, making you think about things you wouldn't have thought about otherwise. Sure. When I watch a French movie, I hope it does, Mm -hmm. you know, all of these things. When I watch a horror movie, I hope it does all of these things. And so it's strange to me, and I don't know if this is similar for everybody, that comedy kind of lives in a different space in my head. I expect different things, and maybe it's not just me. I mean, maybe that's why uncomfortable comedy is sort of a newer phenomenon. It's doing things that have long been done in other places in film, but never to the level that comedy has done it previously. Mm -hmm. It's just recently realized that, hey, we can push boundaries as much as any other type of film and let that be at the core of of what we're doing. I'm excited to talk about Safety Not Guaranteed because I get to be one of those fucking book people uh, this week. Oh, what do you mean? You know, we'll talk about a movie and people will go, man, I saw it back when it was a book. I saw the book and then I read the book and blah 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 so i get to come on and i get to say oh whatever i like safety not guaranteed back when it was still an ad in a magazine right it's feel really good about that i've long talked on this show about being a fan of memes Uh and the things they tell us about our culture and also just that they're really i mean i don't mind just going hey on the surface they're really funny and i'm okay with that Mm mm-hmm in our uh chat transcript on the picture you have sent me in irma god uh game of thrones meme picture before we even started it today <laughs> so i know you kind of come from the same place. oh yeah yeah it is really funny and interesting my favorite me. thing about memes is when they cross over into things i'm already interested in oh god i know um, how good is that <laughs> but uh yeah no i know what you mean this uh there was this ad that the entire movie is based around and that's what i was saying at the beginning of the show about the films being based on very interesting things where clown was based on a Danish TV series that was like critically acclaimed and longstanding that neither you nor I really knew existed Mm -hmm. because we're American scum. And uh, then there's safety, not guaranteed, which is based on an ad. And I don't know. I mean, I I don't know if this was a real thing. I want to say it was, I want to say that it was. Oh, really... I know all about the ad. If you're curious, oh, I would really like to know. <laughs> well, so when I say I'm a fan of memes, it's it is both halves. It's that I find them really funny on the surface, and that I love studying them. I am the most overly analytical meme person you will ever meet. I want to know <laughs> where they came from, when their trends peaked in popularity, what other memes spun off of them, what was happening in the cultural zeitgeist at the time. I want to take memes to the most pretentious level possible. So the time travel ad was, I mean, it, it was a pre-internet, not really because the internet's been around for decades, <laughs> but pre-internet meme popularity existed in print and then I think ballooned in fame when it was on The Tonight Show. Jay Leno did a headline. I was going to, I was actually just going <laughs> to say that I bet it was on headlines on Jay Leno at some point. And I still, again, that doesn't tell me if it's true or not. It just tells me that it was nationally humorous. Well, the level of how true is it is also something the movie plays with uh, a lot. But that is the nature of what makes this interesting. And not to reveal the the magic trick uh, so much and ruin the fun up front, but it was written by a guy who worked for the magazine to essentially fill space in the ad column. So they just needed to make one up and throw it in there and was a creative guy, I guess, and uh, and put that ad in. So I think by the time it got around to somebody like Jay Leno, they sort of knew that it was written by a guy who worked for the magazine. But it might have been investigation after the fact. Mm-hmm. I don't know. 
that level of truth is then played with in the film to go, is this guy, the big question they're trying to answer is, does he really believe in this? And I think then a larger question we dance around it in a, as an audience, I mean, I'm just going to call out the unspoken thing you're not supposed to talk about right away because the movie does finally get to it at the end, which made me feel really good. I thought I was going to have to be embarrassed to fucking ask you about it on the show. But you do actually wonder if they're going to go back in time, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is. I mean, okay, because I feel like I'm stupid for even well, thinking that. For me. And then validated at the end. For me, it feels a lot because, again, I'm a skeptical person and I'm going, okay, so at what point does this guy realize his machine doesn't work? Yeah, but, right, right. I mean, I am, I'm still in the same boat as you. I'm still, I'm, I'm still sitting there going, well, but eventually we have to get to the point where he's in a time machine, right? <laughs> sure, I, sure. I don't, I don't. Well, that's the. I yeah, don't go that's... the extra step of are they or are they not going to go back in time because I don't think they will. And honestly, if I'm being completely transparent, I figure they're definitely not going back in time because that uh, the can has no notes in it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sure, but. Uh, well, I mean, they went back in time and nothing bad happened, clearly. Right. Well, I, I feel like they should have just said, put a note in it if anything happened. Well, then you would have the answer when a note shows up. It would ruin the ending. Come on, man. Think ahead. <laughs> you have to think both ahead and behind in terms of time travel. I was actually considering, is the movie going to go back in time? Sure. And then I felt goofy right. about it. I, I felt embarrassed, like, come on, that's not, that's not even what we're talking about here. It's a conflict, but the big question is, does this guy really believe it or not? Sure. And then we move into the ending, and I feel validated. And the other thing that this film presents that it really doesn't need to, I mean, the film, all it has to be is a crazy guy running people around talking about his time machine, and then at the end, does A or B happen? Yeah. But what it instead does is it takes the three people who you're introduced to throughout the course of the film before we get to the fellow who wrote the article. Mm -hmm. We get the the uh, actual newspaper journalist and then the two interns who we get way more in-depth analysis for these characters than I feel like we even need. Now, I'm not trying to take that away from the film because I think it gives the film a human element that it could be sorely lacking oh, yeah. later on. But we get uh, the reporter who's trying to hook up with his old girlfriend and finds out that he's far less shallow in his uh, desires right. and, and in his ambitions there than he initially thought. And how by being that way, it ruins his life. <laughs> right. How if he were just more shallow. Right. Right. You would be a happier guy. Sure. And we have the the virginal intern who is afraid to get his dick wet for the first time and based on the transcendence of his superior who's now on his side and trying to make him live the life he'll never be able to live. I mean, right. we get these human stories that barely belong in the same universe as time travel. Sure. And I think that that's what gives this film such a fantastically original element is that this movie could very easily be a time travel movie. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be hot tub time machine. <laughs> Sure. Instead, it becomes about trust and humanity and knowing yourself and being true to who you. I mean, all these things that we always see in films and dramas and comedies that end up coming to fruition. Right. But unlike all these other dramas and comedies, this film gives you the ultimate payoff, which is if you're true to yourself and if you're an honest, good person and you know who you are and you trust the right people, you get to go back in time and save your mom. <laughs> Well, I think it's perfect that these things come together. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I don't want to say that they don't belong together. I think it's more that you don't see them together. Sure. You know, if you have this theme of, I don't know, returning to crush dreams or whatever, mm -hmm. not living up to your potential or uh, this sort of nostalgic lack of fulfillment, uh, lack of nostalgic fulfillment, you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Everything you could have had in life that you didn't or going down the wrong path or having regrets. And building all of those stories around time travel in that sort of feel-good 80s family movie type trailer idea of, you know, what if these things happened? And they were kind of funny and quip from the movie and the character learns a little bit about himself with help from his <laughs> friend. You know what I mean? Sure. It's doing all of these cliches that might actually have, I mean, a redeeming purpose to be in films, but were never done as tactfully as safety not guaranteed 
to the point where you look at it happening and you go, well, I don't expect a movie to do both of these things because you've never seen it performed successfully before. Right. You've never seen, you know, of course, time travel is the perfect thing to talk about when you're going past regrets and sure. nostalgia. Right. But that's what you're talking about is mental time travel and also achieving time travel because that is the, for everyone, the universal childhood dream that came true for no one. Right. Everyone was a kid and wanted to travel back in time and uh, no one got to do that. And so the end of the movie is also perfect for that reason is inventing the time machine and going, all right, we have a success case for people who, you know, wanted to travel back and achieve their dreams and do the one thing they couldn't do. So I think it's great that those two things weave together, but I don't want to gloss over the thing you said about characters either, because that's huge for me in this movie. Before I forget that Jeff Garland is in it, he's hilarious. So I'm just oh, glad yeah, he, he has a very briefly in that. Also, film. I am in love with Aubrey Plaza. Aubrey Plaza. Yeah. Yeah. I think we are on the precipice of an Aubrey Plaza explosion that's about to happen. Uh -huh. So we'll see if that actually, you know, we'll chart that over the next year or so of our show. Sure. And see, I would imagine in the next couple of years, you fucking see her everywhere. I think it's just a matter of time of getting out of her television yeah, career exactly. and doing things in film. Yeah. And that's a hard transition for a lot of people to make so i think if we don't see her everywhere it's because she couldn't get out of tv in time for the public fascination but i feel like that's about to happen uh but she has that scene when she first meets um kenneth in the grocery store mm -hmm. she does that kind of superhuman smooth thing where she's putting the can yeah you know but above her or behind her <laughs> Well, yeah, it's awkward, but I think you expect her to fail exactly. in that conversation yeah. a lot more than... Yeah. She doesn't fail at all. She right. does it perfectly. She says everything right the whole time. The thing that's great about it is that Kenneth is looking at her thinking she is absolutely all together and just really solid and aware and a time traveler and just all the general... Sure. Because that's what he wants to perceive. Meanwhile... We as an audience who know that she isn't that way see right. see her. I mean, we see her sweating. Yeah, but sure. Kenneth, who's who's not expecting that she would ever be nervous in this situation, right? Can't see the little tiny things that we see, and that makes it for me. That makes it hilarious, but it also makes it really really cool. Well, this is the thing I love about this movie is this happens over and over with the characters, where in any other film you would expect to see them fail and that sure. would be why it's funny. Mm -hmm. You would expect that she knocks over all the soup cans and that's where the laugh is. Or that she says something, you know, just completely wrong. She says enhance, enhance, enhance. That she just fucks up her conversation, her trying to go undercover. I mean, think about the blueprint for a scene in any kind of farcical comedy where someone is going undercover. Sure. It's because they are bad at going undercover. Sure. That's why it's funny. I immediately go back to uh, Theodore Rex. Well, <laughs> yeah. Do you? Do you immediately go back to Theodore Rex for anything? But, I mean, we don't even need a scene to mention because that's how every fucking right. scene in the history of comedy plays out. And this might be the first one where if you didn't have the context, you could watch it and go... Oh, yeah, Kenneth is the crazy character, but this woman might actually be, you know, a time traveler. Right. You know, you, there, there aren't really any uh, definitive tells. And I think, you know, that lets the characters constantly surprise me through the whole movie. I'm always expecting them to become cartoons, and they're always human the entire time. I want to say they're more real, but I don't even know if that's necessarily more real. I think it's just... You know, when you're watching a movie, maybe more real isn't what you're looking for. Right. Maybe you do want cinematic and you do want uh, fiction. You want it to be exciting. I think the characters just aren't predictable. Mm -hmm. They're not walking through movies the way we've seen people do that before. You know, blowing their cover and making the, the choices that are obviously there for gags. Right. And that lets the movie be captivating in a way that we don't often get to see, especially in this genre. Sure. And Kenneth has to be credited to Mark Duplass, who was the uh, the co-writer director on Jeff Who Lives at Home. Yeah, he's he and his brother write a lot of stuff. Yeah. So when I think, you know, independent comedies of especially the last 10 years, there was a really popular area around Jeff Who Lives at Home, not entirely unlike what we saw with 
you know, the bellflower genre mm-hmm. and how that's kind of growing and people are doing other things in that. Sure. So it's interesting to see Mark act in this movie and have, you know, I don't want to say less creative control, but I guess by necessity, he's not the writer director. He, he has less sure. you know, creative control and he's still fantastic in it. His character is the same way. You're always kind of going, is this guy nuts? But he's not like a cliche nuts. You know, that's uh, it's something Jeff points out too is, well, I think, what does Jeff say? He says something to the effect of, well, he's not full-on retarded. Yeah. You know, but there's definitely something wrong with him. And to have a character that lives in that space, that's a really fascinating space because you don't know what to predict from that character. Mm -hmm. If he's just full-blown whack job nuts, then it's absurdity you're going for, and you're just trying to see how far he can push it. This is a character who you can really sit on the fence about, maybe he's actually inventing time travel. Right. Could it be possible that... You know, uh, they talk a little bit about Einstein, and he plays this role in the same way where it's believable that, yeah, he's a little bit of a nut job, but he might be fucking brilliant. Sure. And that's why he lives in a rundown house right. in the woods. Sure. Or he might be undercover, or he might just be a crazy guy who lives in the woods and steals lasers and fucking stealing lasers, right? He just might be, uh, you know, uh, some kind of criminal. I don't want to say mastermind. Uh, Just criminal, I guess Mm -hmm. it's fine. And you don't know, and that becomes an unknown factor that is interesting for you just in the way that Mark plays that character. The same thing is uh, true of Jake Johnson. Mm -hmm. Jeff is a guy who could be played off as sleazebag boss, played off as guy who's just trying to score, Mm -hmm. but having this really redeemable, not even redeemable, but... I hate just going back to the word human over and over. It's human, yeah. But that's what it is. Well, it's it's, it's a person who makes actual choices and sure. is not a cookie cutter villain. Yeah. And... Well, that's the thing is you could you could write him up as just sleazy douchebag, and sleazy douchebag in a film never has a human moment because whenever the option is, so should he react like a human being or should he say the one liner sleazy right. douchebag thing? The go to is go always the funny. Yeah, yeah, be a sleazy douchebag. Uh huh. But when the question arises in this film, they go, well, I mean, he is a He's a human being. I don't understand why he would, when presented with something this heavy, sure, would sure. remain a sleazy two-dimensional douchebag. And not like there's anything wrong with two-dimensional characters. We see them all the time in movies. Mm-hmm. But I think the most interesting things that happen in this film that aren't directly premise-related, or even some of the things that are, are as a result of the fact that you don't know what the characters are always going to do or how situations are going to play out because they make very real decisions. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, movies don't often go for that. And this one does, and it makes it fascinating. Yeah. I also think there's a lot of game-changing moments in this movie, and that's another thing that is just, you know, I think about it obsessively as I watch it. Moments like when you find out he's being followed. Sure. Suddenly, this is a different type of movie. Right. There's a level of credibility he gets for that Mm -hmm. that you didn't, you go, oh, fuck, he, he is actually being followed what the fuck kind of movie are we in right and now? It, it polarizes him a little more because by introducing the fact that he's being followed, now he suddenly goes from, hey, maybe he's a little weird, but he, you know, he shops at the supermarket or works at the supermarket. It goes from that to, okay, well, he's either dangerous or legit. Yeah, right. I mean, I guess you could still have a hybrid of both. You know, when you see the, uh, the two agents kind of on their own in the car Mm -hmm. they talk to each other like two human beings on a job would right they're they're also not god every fucking role in this movie sure even those two guys are not cartoons right they're not oh the men from the government sure even though everybody talks about them that way Mm -hmm. they're two guys from an agency whose job it actually is to follow this guy and take notes and learn information they're investigative reporters in a way too Mm -hmm. and that doesn't make them entirely indifferent than our main characters in the movie. Right. They're not completely sure what this guy's deal is. They don't have all the answers. And when they see the time machine at the end, they are just as, (laughs) you know, taken aback by it. And so, yeah, the film ends with a legitimate time machine pontoon boat, complete with lasers and fringe style ripple effects. I mean, it's, (laughs) it's all there. Yeah. And then the two characters disappear, presumably into the past. Maybe they are vaporized. Which would also be fine. I'm okay with that, too. The reality of the situation is that, turns out, Kenneth did something scientifically that no one has ever done before. Yeah. And that by trusting him 
Darius is either going to the past or to die. But either way, she's doing it with Kenneth, and that's her overall that's her overall fate based on her trust issues and and really being honest and true to who she is. And so which isn't in, what's interesting about that is even if she did die immediately upon the disappearance of the boat, <laughs> sure. I don't think she was unhappy with that decision. <laughs> right. Also, I think a really good ending. The website is doublefeatureshow.com. The email address is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Oh, the executive man. producers we want to thank are Lucas Draval, Enrique, Mike Shaw, Dust, and Eric Tachek. Mm-hmm. Huge thanks to those guys for helping with the Kickstarter and getting year six together. All right, next week we're bringing it back. We're doing uh, probably something that will um, simultaneously disappoint you and I, Eric, and our audience. <laughs> we are doing the first Killapalooza of year six. Good, good so far. And we're doing that series, that long-awaited horror anthology that people have been begging and begging and begging and begging for us not to cover, and that is Critters. <laughs> yes, Critters. No, I love Critters. I really, really do. Critters, I'm, I'm pumped as hell. I'm sorry, it's not Puppet Master, <laughs> but uh, I think that Critters, Critters is a fucking formidable foray into the world of Killapalooza. Perfect. So I'm there's in. four of them. There's a lot of space because it's a Killapalooza. You can't, you can't Killapalooza without space. Watch more fucking film. Bye.